You're listening to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast, the official podcast of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. We're bringing you the very best from the APSF newsletter and website, as well as the latest information in perioperative patient safety. Thanks for joining us. Patient Safety Podcast. My name is Allie Bechtel, and I'm your host. Thank you for joining us for another show. Today, Dr. Steve Barker joins me on the show for our next interview with an anesthesia patient safety expert. So lace up your shoes or grab a cup of coffee as we get ready to talk about communication, technology education and monitors, and so much more. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. This is actually our second patient safety interview. So it's really exciting new series we're running on the podcast where we interview experts in patient safety from around the world. And we're really happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. To kick off the show, could you introduce yourself and tell us what you are doing currently in the field of anesthesia and patient safety? Sure. I I have an interesting, I think, history, and it's been fun. I started life as an engineer. I got a PhD in aeronautical engineering from Caltech. Uh, I went on to become a tenured professor at UCLA in that field. I then uh, got the bug to get into medicine and went to medical school in my mid-30s. And after getting my MD, I've done 35 years of clinical uh, anesthesia and teaching in academics, 23 of those years as a department chair. Um, I've accumulated over 200 publications. My goal, my general goal has been to combine engineering and medicine in every way I can, learn lessons from engineering, and in particular, lessons from aviation. They have uh, methods of problem solving and learning from their history that uh, could be very helpful to us in anesthesia care, for example. And uh, that's so that's what I'm trying to do. Related to patient safety in particular, was there something that motivated your interest going into focusing on patient safety? There were a couple of things. One that comes to mind, you know, I was always interested, as I said, in the analogies between aviation and medicine and and anesthesia. But uh, in my early days at University of Arizona, where I was the chairman for 18 years, uh, I had to review a case where a doctor in the ICU ordered a drug called Viocase. It's a mixture of pancreatic enzymes, digestive enzymes, obviously intended to be given orally or down a feeding tube. In this case, the patient had a feeding tube. Uh, But uh, since it was so obvious how to give the drug, he didn't bother specifying route of administration. The nurse who picked up the order had never heard of the drug and actually gave it intravenous. Uh, That was, uh, obviously that was fatal. The patient died. It was a patient who had a decent life expectancy. It, uh, it was devastating to the nurse and, uh, and a lot of other people. And so there's a lesson from that. And, and one of the areas I've gotten involved in in patient safety as a result of that is communications. I think that's more than half of the patient safety issues are related to communication failures. What do you think is the best time to start this training for appropriate communication for anesthesia professional? (laughs) The first day of medical school. And that's, you know, that's a, that's been a problem. I mean, medical education, it's great. It's wonderful, but it's kind of slow to catch up with technology. And I, uh, I still do quite a bit of continuing medical education teaching. In fact, I'm doing that next week. Uh, I try to bring more education about technology into those 
uh, lectures because you, you've got to know as a provider, a nurse or a physician, you've, you've got to know a little bit about how the technology works, what's inside the box, not just what the number is on the outside. Um, to, to understand how it got that number and when it might be uh, in, in error. So I, the, in, in short, one word, the answer is education, uh, especially in the area of technology. I agree. And this was something we've worked on with the APSF and the Committee on Technology in the past two years. There's just so many new pieces of anesthesia technology equipment from monitors to infusion pumps. Do you see a way to help address this kind of in modern anesthesia practice to help departments make sure that their anesthesia professionals are ready to use the technology? It's a challenge. And obviously, as you said, it's a balance. I mean, there's, there is such a thing as too much information, too much detail. I don't expect the average anesthesiologist to be able to diagnose exactly what's wrong with a pulse oximeter when it's giving a wrong reading or, or even worse to try to repair it. But I do hope that the average, that, that the anesthesiologist will recognize clinical situations in which it's likely that uh, there's erroneous uh, information and what to do next to try to to try to verify that or or uh, you know the other thing it's like flying an airplane and one my favorite lecture that i give is actually called flying the anesthesia machine where i draw all these analogies between being a pilot and being an anesthesiologist and it is very much like being in a cockpit when one instrument, one technology is giving you a reading that doesn't make sense, you go over the rest of your control panel in the cockpit and see if, <clears throat> see if it correlates, see if there's a pattern that makes that one reading stand out as an obvious error or maybe it fits. And it's the same in the operating room. We've got to learn to examine all of our measured variables continuously and figure out what they mean, not just what they are. And that's, that's what I call flying the anesthesia machine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's a, it's a real challenge. That's, uh, uh, I think, going ahead with anesthesia education, that's going to be our most important challenge, and I love working on it. Well, you mentioned the pulse oximeter, and I saw that that was one of your areas of interest in research, including the pulse oximetry monitoring and accuracy and interpretation. We've actually talked about it before on the podcast. We talked about the accuracy of pulse oximetry monitoring, uh, given that there's a measurement bias in the measurements due to skin tone so that the pulse ox can overestimate the actual oxyhemoglobin saturation in patients with dark skin tones. And this is such a critical monitor to help keep patients safe. Can you talk more about your research in this area? Sure, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, there have been a, a number of recent publications suggesting uh, what you said, that the pulse oximeters may actually miss, be more likely to miss hypoxemia in dark skin uh, subjects. Um, now, I should give my disclosure. I am a a uh, consultant for Massimo, so I have a relationship with that company, long, long-standing relationship. Um, we, as soon as these papers were published, I went back and examined uh, our Massimo calibration uh, data in black versus white subjects, and in all races, actually, but specifically separating those with very dark skin versus light skin. And the results with the, with the Massimo are, are very different. I've published this at the uh, recent meeting of the Society for Technology and Anesthesia called STA. It's on their website. Uh, and what we found was that with the, uh, this oximeter in, in question was the Massimo was called the Mighty Set. It's a fingertip pulse oximeter. And as, as I said, we compared in these calibrations, we take healthy human volunteers 
and we desaturate them, that is we make them hypoxemic and we take their saturations all the way down to 70%, which is lower than you ever hope to see in the operating room, but it's the range where the pulse oximeter has to work. And we found with that Massimo pulse oximeter, there was no significant difference in the error in either the bias or the uh, variation, what's called the precision between black and white subjects. Uh, that's published, as I said, as an abstract. We're working on the full paper now. Uh, I can give you reasons for that. It's because Massimo's technology actually uh, does different signal processing, but that's maybe more detail than you need right now, but uh, happy to discuss any of that. So all pulse oximeters are not equal. That is the conclusion. They are definitely not. And if you look in the details of some of the other published work, um, I mean, it's good. I'm glad they published these preliminary results. But uh, one that I, I spoke to in great detail was the group at University of Michigan, Dr. Schoding's group. They used a whole variety of different pulse oximeters in their data pool. And so the make and model of the pulse oximeter wasn't really controlled. They were looking at uh, a number of different medical centers. So we've got to, we've got to focus down and, and look at specific instruments. And obviously the data I just told you about with the Massimo was volunteer data in our laboratory, healthy volunteers. We need to also uh, gather clinical data in real patients. I'm confident we'll get the same results, but we need to do that for completeness. What is your favorite anesthesia monitor? <laughs> I thought about that. And, you know, that's like asking me, what is my favorite symphony? It's, uh, it depends on what mood I'm in, uh, whether I want uh, Beethoven or Schubert. But I, I guess most of the time, I would probably say the, the pulse oximeter, because in its recent evolution, it has gone so far beyond just the original Aoyagi who invented it. Uh, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, um, it, it measures a lot more than just the arterial blood saturation now. The, the multi-wavelength pulse oximeters, again, being developed by Massimo, measure, uh, for example, your total hemoglobin. So I, I have one right here. I can check my total hemoglobin with a pulse oximeter, and it gives me a number that's correct within less than one gram per deciliter, and it follows trends. So I can measure my hemoglobin today and next week and see how it's changing. They also monitor the presence of dyshemoglobins, which can be very dangerous and which can occur in the operating room. Of course, that includes carboxyhemoglobin, which you get from smoke inhalation, and also methemoglobin, which we as anesthesiologists we usually cause that with all the different drugs we give. Any of the nitrites and nitrates will induce methemoglobin. And um, so we, it's, it's good to be able to measure that. Another thing we're measuring now with a pulse oximeter is tracking the patient's uh, intravascular volume status by analyzing the variability, the amplitude variability of the what's called the plethysmograph, the raw waveform of the light absorbance, you know, the pulsating waveform. That has an amplitude that varies up and down with respiration. And the, and the degree of that variation depends on your volume status. And we've got studies showing that. So bottom line, short version, there's a lot of new things that we're measuring with pulse oximeters. And it, it's, it's very exciting. I see more new stuff on the horizon. And I'm looking forward to helping with that. The one thing we always joke about in the operating room, and this is just as a funny aside, is that the pulse oximeter cable always seems to be the shortest one and is more likely to, to not reach well to the patient. The cables, yes. I, thank you for saying that. I'll pass that on. But uh, yeah, we do. Um, we did recognize that at Massimo and they have added longer cables, but you're right. I've observed that too. But you know, since you mentioned it, the other nice thing is, do you really need a cable? This one right here that I'm showing you has a Bluetooth link in it. So while it's on my finger and you see no wires at all, 
It can be Bluetooth connected to my iPhone or to this computer or to my anesthesia monitor. That's especially useful during transport where you're moving the patient from the OR table to the gurney to the recovery room and you don't want to be messing around with cables. So yeah, it's an important point. Thank you so much to Barker for joining me on the show today. The good news is that this is only part one. That's right. We will be back next week with more of my conversation with Barker. So mark your calendars. If you have any questions or comments from today's show, please email us at podcast at APSF.org. Please keep in mind that the information in this show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or legal advice. We hope that you will visit APSF.org for detailed information and check out the show notes for links to all the topics we discussed today. We also hope that you will connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We can continue the conversation about anesthesia patient safety all week long while waiting for the next podcast to drop. Until next time, stay vigilant so that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care.